Alrighty, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started now. So I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today and welcome to today's CNC webinar to Kubernetes Zero to Hero Deployments and Managements. So my name is Daniel O. I'm working for Red Hat as a technical marketing major, uh, specialized in uh, cloud native application development. And I also uh, responsible for CNC ambassador. So I will be uh, moderating today's webinar, and we'd like to welcome our presenter today, Anthony Ramirez, the director of Conserving uh, Nebula Works. And there's a few uh, couple of things to housekeep the item before we get started. Uh, during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. So there are Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your question in there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So this is the uh, official webinar of CNCF. So as such, it is subject to CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything uh, to the chat or a question. Uh, it would be violation of the code of conduct. So basically, uh, please be respectful for all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note uh, the recording and the slides will be posted later today to CNCF webinar page yet. Uh, www.cncf.io slash webinars. With that all, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Anthony to kick off today's presentation. Anthony, take it away. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Great to see the uh, participant list filling up here. Uh, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank uh, Kim, Christy, and Daniel who are part of the CNCF that helped put all this together. Uh, and Anne Lynn, who is a marketing director at NebulaWorks that assisted me in getting all of this uh, put together as well. So thank you all. I appreciate all the time and effort put into this. And uh, hopefully everybody is of good health and staying safe. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about Kubernetes. I'm gonna be talking about how teams can uh, start to bootstrap themselves into leveraging Kube, uh, leveraging a tool called Helm and how Terraform or infrastructure as code fits into that uh, vision. So my name is Anthony Ramirez, uh, as Daniel mentioned. I've been working in the container space for about four and a half, five years now. Um, working at NebulaWorks for about five years. Before that, I was uh, doing a short work assignment at NASA JPL uh, and also have done work in systems integration. So uh, the cloud and Kubernetes has been uh, part of my duties for a few years now. So in this talk, uh, I hope to share a few things. So this talk was designed for uh, full stack engineers, DevOps engineers, or generally anybody that's working on managing infrastructure. So nowadays with uh, responsibilities shifting way left, we are finding development teams having to manage infrastructure uh, more commonly and the entire stack from infrastructure provisioning to application configuration and deployment is now the responsibility of um, maybe one team versus silo teams. So this talk is for uh, that persona and specifically people that are trying to understand how to get started with Kubernetes, understanding some uh, cloud native and open source models that they can use to uh, start taking advantage of container orchestration platforms. In this talk, I'm talking about open source tools. I'm talking about deploying EKS clusters or Kubernetes clusters to Amazon. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how containers provide productivity for developers, um, discuss infrastructure as code and some of those concepts, why it's advantageous. And I'll show a demo of the EKS cluster I have provisioned in Amazon using Terraform, as well as a demo of deploying a application with Helm. Uh, so this is supposed to provide a cohesive understanding of how all of these tools fit together. And this is from my experience working with uh, very large organizations, adopting containers, uh, deploying applications and systems to the cloud. So you might be familiar with some of these concepts. You might be doing it in a similar way or a different way. Um, but generally, it's to put all of these tools together and show how they fit. Uh, as we've seen in the last couple of decades, there's been a huge shift from how teams are managing ap applications, managing infrastructure, uh, Patterns of monolithic applications are now transitioning to microservices uh, due to technologies like containers to the contributions that Google made to the Linux kernel that includes C groups and namespaces. And generally, I'd like to address those uh, things. I'd like to talk about how we can increase developer productivity. And since there's so many tools out there, I hope to distill down the tool set that you would need to get started with Kubernetes. 
So Docker has uh, become a very popular open source container runtime. There's an enterprise wing to it. However, uh, the open source tool itself has gained a lot of popularity over the years. Uh, and there's other runtimes that exist and that have become useful for teams, but Docker seems to have a, a large community of people using it. So there's other runtimes that are compatible with Kubernetes like ContainerD and Cryo. Uh, but my experience ha over the past few years is uh, primarily using Docker as the uh, runtime uh, and leveraging the Docker file as the method of container creation, image creation. So working for NebulaWorks, which is a consultancy over the past few years, I found myself in meetings with teams uh, trying to justify the use of container technology or building a business case uh, to potentially adopt these patterns, adopt these technologies and propagate this across teams. So this persona uh, may use on-premise hardware. They may have strict silos in their team structures and are trying to figure out how to develop containers and how to secure them. Um, so I believe that there are some benefits of using containers. Uh, those are uh, matter of fact type things. Um, and I'm not saying that containers are silver bullets um, either. They have their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, their, their quirks and their exploits. So it may not be right for every use case. However, they have advantages that we should uh, always keep in the back of our heads. So first and foremost, one of the, the things I enjoy about containers is that they're based on Linux technologies. As I mentioned, they are uh, a result of Google's contribution to the Linux kernel and uh, about a decade ago, or a little bit less than that, which included C groups and namespaces, which provide the ability to create isolation for services running on the same host. So these containers uh, operated similarly to things like Solaris zones or BSD jail. So if you're familiar with that, the container um, concept is, uh, is very familiar. The way that you actually use the, the interface or the APIs is different. So um, Docker itself is pretty easy to use. It has a very streamlined developer workflow, which I'll be talking about in a second. But uh, like other server templating tools, containers allow us to package our apps and our dependencies into a container image using a copy and write file system. Um, so the process of building containers results in artifacts that are number one, lightweight, and they're, they're more lightweight than VMs. Um, you package a single service or application into a container and maybe have some sidecar for logging or metrics collection or something like that. But the idea is that you wanna have one uh, application running in a container you want to avoid noisy neighbor syndrome. You want to have separation of concerns and create services that are discrete and that can be scaled independently and horizontally versus uh, vertically, which you would have to do with the monolithic uh, application structure. Uh, second is that they're portable. We know the, the classic, uh, um, the, the, the constant reminder to us why we use containers is to avoid the, it works on my machine um, dilemma. So if a development team was building something in an operation team or an individual was supporting the infrastructure uh, sometimes these devs will throw applications over the wall and just have the, the operations teams figure out how to deploy them. So with containers, we can shift left uh, the creation, testing, uh, and build of these containers with a uh, Docker runtime on your workstation or having a CI system that has the Docker runtime. A lot of CI systems nowadays leverage containers as their runners, so that makes it very easy to run unit tests to have consistency across the build stage, uh, all the way to testing, testing and development, staging, and eventually production. So packaging is streamlined across this, uh, uh, this workflow. And we can place these uh, minted images once we build these images into a registry, a container registry, resulting in a consistent experience for everybody that's pulling and deploying that. Uh, and since containers are inherently smaller in size, as I mentioned, they can be scaled horizontally, uh, which is very advantageous for us. Um, it takes less hardware. We could uh, leverage more densification in our servers. And it allows us to, to use, uh, and it encourages us to use microservice-based uh, architecture patterns. Uh, and microservices themselves, there's a lot of content on that. I recommend um, reading about uh, it through uh, some blogs through ThoughtWorks. I thought had some great stuff. Um, however, microservices essentially allow us to create discrete services, expose them via some uh, standardized API, like a REST API. and there's separation of concerns between different services. So if there's many discrete teams, uh, they could iterate on their service independently without affecting each other. This is great because uh, we have higher velocity of feature creation. There's not that many dependencies. And since everything's exposed through a single API, uh, there's not much changing for consumers of that service. Uh, so anything happening or changes happening on the back end behind that is uh, abstracted away from different services. So there's a few advantages to microservices. Uh, they can get overly complicated and they're not, again, a silver bullet, um, but they do promote advantageous patterns for dev teams. 
So containers are uh, very useful. Um, they show them to be very useful for, in my experience, for teams. Um, and a very common um, pattern that I see that, or that I have seen over the years is the way that teams develop containers. So the first step would be a developer uh, that has a container runtime on their workstation. They're building, they're testing, uh, they're breaking their containers, they're baking in their application, their general purpose programming languages into these containers. And uh, since containers are, were intended to be a developer centric or developer focused tool, um, they are really easy to create. They allow developers to go ahead and create um, different versions of their images without affecting any production environment. Um, so developers now have the ability to be a part of that deployment process, that delivery process. Um, so just to give you guys some context, the code that the, this developer would be writing would probably be stored in a place like GitHub or GitLab and teams are most likely following a standardized branching strategy and a versioning strategy such as trunk based development or GitHub flow. Uh, so this happy developer gets some warm tea and some, some strong coffee, iterates on their application, um, uh, builds an image and pushes their code up to a repository in their feature branch. Uh, there's some uh, pull request review process that happens. Um, and once this happens, a CI job typically runs and once the Docker file runs a set of unit tests for the general purpose language and any other test that this team finds relevant. Uh, typically there's a, uh, if in, in the baking process, there's tools like Twistlock or native features in uh, the Elastic Container Registry in Amazon that provide native image scanning sol uh, solutions. So you could run um, vulnerability scans against images that you create. Um, and after the approval process happens, the container is ready to be pushed to a registry. So a container registry holds a production ready image that's versioned, it's, uh, it's tagged, and we understand that it has been uh, tested on different environments and works across a, ser a series of different environments. So eventually when it runs in production, um, the experience of deploying this should be very similar to what we have done in staging development and on the developer workstation. Um, and I'll share a little bit about how to create consistency across these environments when we introduce Terraform to manage our clusters. Uh, but generally this workflow is very common. And when it comes to building Kubernetes applications, containers are wrapped up in a pod. So containers have to exist in this life cycle. So understanding that this is a common workflow and that in this workflow, there are things like branching strategies that uh, must be taken into consideration, uh, versioning and generally release engineering practices uh, that relate specifically to image creation. Um, and, you know, at, at one point a few years back when um, there wasn't that many orchestration tools when Docker Swarm was barely coming out, um, there wasn't Docker Compose, there wasn't any sort of Docker stacks available. So uh, running these containers, building these containers uh, was pretty much something you had to have uh, a really good handle on. And uh, once Kubernetes came, uh, became more popular, once Docker Swarm had more features to deploy multi-container applications, uh, those types of patterns started to arise and have their own uh, testing related to them. So if you're deploying uh, services, you want to be able to test that when you deploy a stack that the three instances of some application can connect to each other. That's kind of a different uh, problem set. This one is specifically around uh, image creation and minting. So working for NebulaWorks, uh, I've had the privilege to work with some very large brands providing build engineering services, uh, training and consulting. And there's a, a continuum that we have found uh, that is somewhat consistent across teams that are attempting to adopt containers. So the initial step is to build an orchestration platform for a team to use. Uh, in the past, I've worked on bootstrapping or automating the deployment of open source Docker uh, Swarm clusters. I used Ansible to bootstrap Kubernetes onto uh, on-prem uh, nodes, as well as Raspberry Pis, using managed services like EKS or AKS. Um, but the idea is that you need a cluster up and running to start the journey. And obviously this is not gonna be a production grade cluster, but it's something to get you going. It's something that allows teams to start experimenting. Um, and once you have this process baked out to deploy one, hopefully you have some automation or using something like infrastructure as code that allows you to duplicate these environments very easily. Uh, so the first, the first step is to get started there. Uh, the second is to identify the domains to test and secure. Uh, for example, uh, sec testing the general purpose programming language that you're writing in, as I mentioned before, Dockerfile linting, um, an image build 
testing process, uh, container deployment, and so forth. So certain teams may have different needs in order to uh, secure and test their applications. So understanding what those domains are, uh, getting the team together, understanding what their requirements are, the, developer, the developers themselves, um, and helping um, create some alignment and some uh, level setting across the team to make sure that all uh, use cases are accounted for. And you can set up the appropriate guardrails for development teams in order for them to focus more on their application. Um, so the next step after identification of these domains is to actually execute uh, securing them. So as I mentioned, uh, there's some image vulnerability scanning solutions that exist that can get you some very easy wins. There's other open source solutions like Claire, um, like um, Anchor that you can use and integrate into your CI process. There's also native cloud uh, image vulnerability scanning solutions for your containers. Uh, so understanding that those tools exist and understanding how to use them is very important. And finally, end-to-end um, -end telemetry and security. So monitoring and logging containers versus virtual machines or bare metal is, is uh, slightly different. There's more layers to uh, begin to analyze here. Um, so first, there's uh, the container level, the container logging metrics, application tracing, uh, machine metrics for the nodes that are running uh, as part of a cluster, uh, as well as the, the, the Kubernetes or the container orchestration platform itself. Um, so all of these uh, tool, these different systems need to be uh, monitored and logged. And uh, so this may take a little while. Your organization may have some standard tools for logging and metrics collection. So integrating those into the container solution uh, is something that I find um, is takes a little bit more time. And then being able to consolidate that data, whether it's machine metrics or logs, um, consolidating that and being able to perform some analysis on it in order to extract relevant information. So setting up alerting, things like that. Um, so over time, once the team understands the, the domains that exist in, in this kind of factory, this workflow, um, their skills with, with containers, with Kubernetes, with the tooling around um, the testing, the securing, the telemetry begin to increase and they could start driving business uh, value much faster. So as you can see, it's a, it's a progressive uh, journey. It's not a one state that you get to when you're done. Um, it's understanding that it is a journey and that sometimes teams that may just be getting started need a path forward that's simple, that is transparent, and that gets them value fast. Um, there's been times where people have in, uh, worked with teams that are building POCs, but there's no attempt to standardize on these, the continuous integration workflows or the continuous delivery workflows. Uh, there's no uh, intention to standardize on the branching strategies. Uh, so having that in the back of your head and understanding that when you do have standards, when you, when you enforce the standards, it typically makes it easier to automate things versus development teams doing, um, if they're doing kind of whatever they want to do, it makes it a little more difficult to understand what tools can help them achieve what they want. But having a baseline standard and going from there, uh, in my experience, has helped teams um, really take advantage of, of these technologies. Uh, and now Kubernetes. So containers provide some uh, isolation for us. They provide a uh, streamlined workflow for packaging up our images um, from a development perspective. Um, after a few iterations of building containers, um, running through the you know, pull request approval process, this becomes second nature. Um, so now if we wanted to deploy hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of containers, it would be much too cumbersome to do it um, manually um, or even with the script. So in order to, to, to solve this problem of massively scaled container deployments, um, we introduced, uh, not, you know, not myself, but the, the community um, introduced uh, container orchestration platforms. Uh, so Kubernetes is that. And, and Kubernetes makes it easy to deploy and manage uh, container-based applications. And Kubernetes is, is like an operating system for a cluster. So developers don't have to include infrastructure related components uh, or services within their applications definitions. So infrastructure is abstracted away from developers. Um, there's a lot of reasons why Kubernetes is a great tool to use if you're not already using it. It exposes compute resources as a single deployment platform. Um, so you can um, define a cluster um, and if you provide a manifest, you post a manifest to the Kubernetes uh, API, it will go ahead and deploy that container uh, application on your behalf and you don't really have to worry about where it's being deployed to. You could even provide 
specific uh, selectors or options where you, if you have a requirement for that application to run on a specific type of hardware, Kubernetes will go ahead and find that out for you. Um, so generally it's a scalable platform. It's flexible. Uh, it's a platform for building platforms. So how did we get to, to Kubernetes? Um, well, uh, about a decade ago, Google um, had a uh, internal orchestration platform called Borg. Uh, if you're familiar with Borg, um, it was uh, kind of the first uh, container orchestration platform that um, might have been the first at Google, but it was widely used at Google and began uh, to create a long line of other orchestration platforms to get us where we are today. Um, so Borg is an internal clustering platform that uh, is similar to Kubernetes, but the interface and the API looked quite different. Uh, so over the years, Google understood that there was some inefficiencies with that Borg architecture. So they created a tool called Omega. And Omega intended to improve the design decisions, the way that developers were posting jobs and general internal uh, architecture was improved upon uh, in Omega and those changes folded back into Borg. So over the years, uh, Google was consistently improving their uh, clustering software. Um, and last but not least, most recently, Kubernetes came out of that uh, uh, type of work. So this container orchestration platform was designed based on all the stuff that Google learned building Omega and Borg. And they wanted to make a very developer focused platform um, to abstract away all the infrastructure, make everything a REST API, um, and so uh, to simplify that um, architecture as well as make it easy for developers to consume. And this is a architecture diagram that you all might be familiar with. It was just borrowed from the Kubernetes.io website. So on the left side, we have the Kubernetes control plane and this control plane consists of a, a, a series of services that um, essentially provide the ability to create uh, applications on the Kubernetes cluster. So this includes etcd, the API server, a, a, a bunch of controllers that are in charge of creating specific objects, the scheduler. And on the right side, we have the Kubernetes nodes themselves. So this is the uh, machines that are actually running the workloads. Um, and it's best practice to not run workloads on the control plane. So everything's running on the right. Um, so um, one thing to note is that if we were to self-host this, uh, it's good to have uh, an HA setup. So you might need to back up etcd, um, have a three master node minimum for the control plane, be able to have automation to easily deploy this control plane, update it, um, manage it, and so forth. So managing this on your own might be a little bit cumbersome. Um, however, it's been done in the past. I've done it personally uh, about a dozen times. And as long as you have the automation, you have the scripts, it's, uh, you know, once you build them, it's, it's uh, uh, downhill from there. Uh, however, having a team or individual manage that control plane creates unnecessary overhead, which is why uh, if you are getting started, I would recommend using a uh, Kubernetes managed service. So one that I'm very comfortable with is the Elastic Kubernetes service. So this is a, the Kubernetes platform that's available to use in Amazon. Uh, the control plane is abstracted away. So you can uh, just basically focus on provisioning the nodes themselves and then connect to your EKS cluster um, with, a, with a certificate that's provided to you and uh, run the uh, Kubernetes applications that you like. So the EKS service or any other services uh, that are similar to this um, make it very easy to get bootstrapped. And today, if we look at the three big clouds, they all have a Kubernetes managed. They're all generally available. They're all maybe uh, one minor version behind the latest Kubernetes release, one or two. There's, some there's always some version lag there. Um, they have RBAC, they have multi-AZ, and about a year ago, uh, this, this chart or this table would not have been true. Uh, there wasn't GA and AKS, um, and some of them did not support multi-AZ. So, uh, you know, just to give you a, a comparison, um, I, as I said, I'm most comfortable with Amazon, so I would use EKS, but the service model for these um, platforms or these, these platforms as a service, or they're more uh, uh, infrastructure as a service, are very similar. They abstract with a control plane. Uh, you manage the nodes that you want to be the worker nodes and you begin to distribute applications to that cluster. So imagine that you're going to take the plunge to start using Kubernetes uh, in the cloud or on premise. It doesn't really matter. How would you manage that infrastructure? Would it be manually? Maybe it's using a configuration management tool or bash scripts or um, you know, any other method in order to configure services onto hosts. 
Um, the way that we have managed infrastructure has evolved over the years. So instead of manually configuring uh, and installing servers and networks, we can represent infrastructure uh, virtually and as source code. So why is, why is that advantageous for us? Why, is, why should we use infrastructure as code? Well, for starters, since it's code, we can apply uh, software conventions and standards around how we build something. Uh, we can add comments into what we're doing. Uh, we have the ability to take advantage of declarative languages. So uh, uh, taking advantage of a declarative language, we'll get into a second, allows us to define the desired state of something and let that go reconcile it for us. Um, we can encourage self-service. So if we have uh, an infrastructure as code, code base and a development team is leveraging it, this encourages everybody to participate. If there's a single repository where there's code that uh, exists, we can make pull requests. We can create a backlog of issues and let a team or the community help burn that down. So these, uh, these types of patterns that exist in software engineering and development can be applied to our infrastructure today. Uh, another great reason to use infrastructure as code is that you can um, move faster and safer with automation. So if you have CI, CD1, CD2 uh, workflows, you can add in automation to test the infrastructure's code that you're building. Um, you can have release engineering processes over it. So there's a lot of great reasons why infrastructure's code uh, is advantageous. So uh, at Nebelworks where I work, uh, we use Terraform. So Terraform is an open source uh, tool that is cloud agnostic and allows you to deploy and provision resources using a declarative language. There's other tools like Pulumi, which is also a great tool for infrastructure's code if you haven't used it, allows you to use uh, any general purpose programming language in order to provision and manage your infrastructure. The idea here is that uh, if we have an agnostic uh, tool, we're able to pivot from cloud to cloud as we deem necessary. Uh, so having something that's very specific to the cloud platform like ARM templates or CloudFormation, they're, they're good tools, they, they work well. However, um, they don't really provide transferable skills. So Terraform, for example, if you learn Terraform, you learn one domain specific language called HCL, and you're able to transfer those skills, that knowledge across multiple cloud platforms. Uh, declarative, so, de so declarative uh, languages uh, operate differently than imperative languages. So the main difference here is that in imperative uh, languages or imperative tools, you have to provide a procedural definition in how to execute some program. Uh, so it's step after step where declarative is um, providing an end state or a desired state and allowing the tool to focus on how to, how to actually reach that end state. Um, so the difference between, for example, Ansible, which would be imperative, and Terraform, for example, would be if you wanted to provision um, 10 EC2 instances um, with Ansible, uh, you, could do that, you could do that as well with Terraform, and you wanted to scale up to 15. Um, if you created, if you added five to that um, Ansible manifest, it will create 15 more. It doesn't really understand that something already exists, um, but with Terraform, you could upscale that um, node count and Terraform will understand that something already exists, so it only needs to add five more versus 15. Uh, so there's some advantages to that. Another one is that since we're using uh, repositories to handle all this source code, we could treat the source code as a source of truth. There's a popular term that's kind of going around called GitOps um, that essentially means driving all operations through the, the, the code, through the source code management tool, um, so we can apply these software development, software engineering practices, continuous integration, for example, um, uh, approval, uh, review approval processes, all these things that we do with general purpose languages, we can apply to infrastructure as code. So we can add rigor to it. We can add a, a layer of um, automation, security, uh, and so on. And another great uh, feature of Terraform or generally these types of infrastructure tools code tools is desired state management. Uh, this means basically uh, state is information about infrastructure that you have deployed. So if you wanted to make changes to an existing deployment, Terraform would be able to reconcile what exists in reality based on what your manifest defines in your local workstation. So if you wanted to make an update, you could transparently do that with the Terraform plan and apply. So why am I talking about Terraform so much? What's the point of infrastructure as code and how does it relate to Kubernetes? Well, uh, here's an example, and I'll jump into a demo really quick, but just to show you, uh, this is Terraform. So uh, the resource is a keyword here. These are keywords. And the second variable or value here is uh, the resource type. So in, in this case, I'm, I'm deploying an EKS cluster 
and an EKS node group. Uh, so the control plane and the worker nodes. Uh, and I'm naming them uh, something that is identifiable for myself. And since I had a pre-provisioned VPC that I was using in our sandbox environment um, that's provided to us by my organization, I just referenced these and I could have used a data uh, resource here to pull down data from that VPC. But for the sake of simplicity, I just added in a few private subnets that I'd like to deploy my node groups to, um, to my instances from my node group to. So here uh, is that two resources that allow me to create and manage an EKS cluster. There's a couple of more that I'm not showing and those are role policies um, and an IAM role. And this essentially allows these EC2 instances that are part of the cluster uh, specific uh, permissions to query metadata uh, and so on. So I'm gonna pivot over to my terminal. Um, hopefully everybody sees this okay. I think the font is big enough. Uh, so this directory has a few resources. Uh, so I just showed you the EKS file. Um, so again, there's two resources here, the cluster and the node group. And in the variables section, I have a cluster name. That's just something uh, I had a default for since in our uh, sandbox environment that I'm testing this in, we have a VPC with subnets that have pre-existing uh, annotations, Kubernetes annotations. So I just had to match this up to what was already pre-provisioned for me. And uh, this deployment is actually already um, done. I did this deployment earlier because it takes about 15 minutes. So I wanted just to prove to you guys that this deployment exists. So I'm gonna run the Terraform show command. That's just gonna show me pre-provisioned um, or, or infrastructure that I've already provisioned. So we have the EKS cluster, it's providing me the certificate authority. Um, there's information about the VPC, where the node groups are gonna live, the node group itself, um, the AMI type that I'm using, um, all this stuff is provisioned in reality. So I'm just gonna make sure my uh, profile, my AWS profile is set here. And there's an AWS EKS command that I could run that allows me to update my kube config in order to authenticate to the cluster. Um, quickly about Terraform, there's a, there's a few nifty things that you can do to validate that the uh, files that you're building are um, built correctly. Um, so if I just ran Terraform help here, and there's a couple of commands that I'd like to show you. One of them is Terraform font. So Terraform font uh, could be added to your um, your Vim to auto font something to your, uh, when you automatically, when you save, it could automatically run this, or you could add font to a CI process. But essentially this provides you uh, spacing standards in all of your Terraform files so that there's consistency across uh, all the spacing um, and how you set up uh, a general resource in Terraform. Another tool that I'd like to share with you is called validate. So if I accidentally made a typo, there's no variable called bluster.name, but if I accidentally did that and I ran a, ter I ran a Terraform validate without having to plan or apply anything, it'll be able to spit back to me, hey, this, uh, this variable doesn't exist. Um, did you mean cluster name? So I can go back in to that uh, file, update the error, and run the same command and it shows that it's valid. So this is just a very basic example to show you that you could add uh, Terraform linting to a CI process. Um, so to show you that the cluster is up, I'll run a few uh, kubectl commands. So I did uh, just provision uh, two nodes here and show you desired size two, min size one. So there's a scaling configuration associated with the node group and uh, the instance types or my nodes are running M4 extra ledges. So the reason I have M4 extra ledges was um, basically I was running uh, a, the Kubeflow platform, which is just a machine learning uh, or data science platform that you can run on top of Kubernetes. And uh, the minimum requirements were a single node of 12 gigabytes and two vCPUs. So I just chose the appropriate size. Uh, one thing I learned though, was that uh, the instance types are uh, variable. So in terms of their compatibility with EKS. So make sure to double check on the instance type and make sure it's compatible to be used as a worker node in your Kubernetes cluster. There was one that was a, it was like an A1, it was the A series instance types that was cheaper than the M4 extra large with the same specs, the sp same specs. But um, I tried to use that instance type without checking the um, table of what the compatibility and it didn't work. And I was trying to figure out what's going on. And it was the instance type that was not compatible. And there's also some AMI types that are not compatible. Uh, but you could also pass in your own AMI types. 
So that, uh, just to also show you um, just some more information about the Kube cluster. Um, this is uh, working well. It's uh, allowing me to make queries to it. And um, that is basically how you can manage a Kubernetes cluster with Terraform. Um, in, in a production setting, but I, what we have done is to make a structure similar to this. And this is not a full uh, working example of that structure. However, uh, typically when we do build, uh, we're working on engagements, building uh, two Terraform code bases for our clients, we have discrete directories. So development, uh, production, and staging, as you can see in this tree here on this level, and a modules directory. So I'm not going to get into modules, but basically if I pulled this um, tree into the modules directory, I can reference it in this directory dev prod and stage and make a module reference. And that allows me to have discrete state management for three discrete environments. Um, so this example was just to show you the, the, the very simple, a very simple way that you can get started with Kubernetes. So back to the deck, um, there was one tool that, that I would like to share with everybody here, and it was um, Helm. So if you're not familiar with Helm, um, Helm, according to the website, is the best way to find, share, and use software built for Kubernetes. Um, and this tool has evolved a little bit. In um, the last KubeCon I went to in San Diego, they announced uh, Helm 3, and that was basically removing the server-side compo component tiller that existed with Helm 2. Um, and that's a great, uh, great tool to package and deploy applications. So I wanted to just show a quick demo of running uh, a Helm chart onto my cluster. So I'm gonna deploy a tool called Prometheus and Prometheus is uh, basically gonna help us extract metrics about our containers, our nodes and so on. So Helm uh, is a CLI tool. So this is a preloaded command that I have that installs Prometheus um, one thing it does require was a, a namespace called Prometheus. So I actually already um, created this namespace already. So just to double check, I just kube ctl get namespace and was able to see that the Prometheus namespace was there. So when I run the Helm install command, the few options that I can pass in, um, it's creating a persistent volume. Um, it's providing the namespace called Prometheus and currently installing this Prometheus deployment to the cluster. So as we can see, it's, it's sent back some information. Um, it's talking to us about uh, how we can access different endpoints that were uh, made available by Prometheus. So for example, um, this is the, um, your, the endpoint 9090 provides us access to the dashboard. So if I run this command, it just exports the pod name and then runs the kubectl port forward command. Um, and will allow me to access the service on my local host. So if I local host uh, 9090, uh, here's the Prometheus dashboard. So if I wanted to get information about container metrics or container memory, I could select an option here. Oh, where did I go? So generally you could, um, you have a, a different selection of, of, of stats that you can um, monitor. So for example, just grabbing a random one here. Um, so go metrics, uh, go any sort of go metrics, you can select that, execute uh, and build graphs. And also there's some endpoints that uh, are made available such as the gateway that allows you to scrape uh, metrics from Prometheus. But, uh, the purpose of this demo is to show you how easy it was to deploy a Helm chart. Um, you just leverage a CLI tool with a pre-existing uh, cluster and be able to consume um, pre-built applications uh, such as Prometheus. And I'm going to cancel that port forward. There was one other uh, thing I'd like to share with you guys. And it was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a deployment of Kubeflow. So this is just a um, machine uh, learning platform that I deployed to this Kubernetes cluster. And I use the tool called Kubes uh, or CFCTL. Um, and this is, the, this is the tool. So if you go to the Kubeflow website, you could download this binary, um, set some environment variables. So like what manifests to deploy and um, run CFCTL apply uh, if you have a pre-existing cluster created. 
and it will be able to deploy um, a, bit, uh, a bootstrap version of Kubeflow to your cluster. So I just ran a kubectl get pods uh, dash n kubeflow. So this is the kubeflow namespace. So all of these services are related to kubeflow. So we see we have Argo UI for CD, um, some pipeline services, and I am running some Jupyter notebooks on this. Interesting uh, note about kubeflow is that this uh, platform runs Istio in the back end for all traffic management. So uh, it's a great, it's a very interesting tool. Um, it's uh, composed of many different services. So Istio was a great option for them to, to build in. So I just wanted to quickly share with you the fact that, um, for example, if there's a data science team that you're supporting um, and they wanted to run some this cluster, uh, an infrastructure team that is in charge of Terraform could easily provision that Kubernetes cluster for them. Um, there could be some you know, automation involved in bootstrapping the Kubeflow platform using KXUTL. And from this platform, so I'm doing a port, a port forward on another terminal off screen here. It's localhost 8081. Um, so this is running in my Kubernetes cluster. I could provision what are called notebook servers. So a new server could just be selecting an image. These are all pre-built TensorFlow images that Google provides you. Um, but for example, if you're uh, familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, this will look very familiar. Um, but basically you could leverage a uh, um, interactive development environment um, in Python or any other sort of application dependencies that you wanna uh, inject in the container, you can build that container and build a notebook from it. Uh, and this is just running a, an experiment uh, importing the TensorFlow library in Python. And it's pulling some images from this public database that uh, has a bunch of images uh, and doing some, um, it's just running some algorithms against those images. So just to uh, recap, this, this is an entire platform, Kubeflow, and provides a very niche set of uh, libraries and tools for um, data scientists. So Kubernetes is, as I mentioned earlier, a platform for platforms. So if you wanted to get bootstrapped quickly and be able to, to deploy these sophisticated tools like Kubeflow, Kubernetes makes it pretty simple. As I showed you the history here, I just ran a history, piped it to grep for KFCTL. This is basically what it took to deploy that uh, Kubeflow environment and um, essentially running a port forward against an Istio ingress gateway and allows me to start running experiments um, with the models or algorithms that I would like. So that will conclude the demo section. Um, so to recap, um, I wanted to just share with everybody what I would like the main takeaways to be. So containers enable developer productivity. Uh, they enable portability, seamless transition from development way left to production, which is on the right. Uh, Kubernetes, the container orchestration platform, provides the stability to deploy and manage container-based apps. The cloud offers great options for managed services. Infrastructure as code provides a very sane way to build and create repeatable and transparent infrastructure. And Helm is also a great tool to deploy applications onto Kubernetes. Uh, so all of these tools put together can really help bootstrap your application teams, putting standards around these tools and processes. Um, in my experience has provided teams to move uh, which much, with much higher velocity uh, than uh, methods that they were using before. So that concludes this presentation and thank you so much everybody for attending. And uh, at this point, I'll hand it back to Daniel. Awesome. Thanks often for great presentation and really practical demos. I love that. So now we have some time for questions. So if you have any question and uh, you would like to ask, please drop in in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we will get as many as we have time for. So it's time for to question. Actually, uh, we just got one question here. Uh, yeah, so, so would we use ham plus the infrastructure as a code as just one from Maja? Um, so, uh, so, so could we use Helm plus Isaac? Oh uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I, in my, so there are um, providers in Terraform to manage Kubernetes applications. Uh, however, I think there needs to be some, uh, a, a discussion around the scope of each of these tools. So infrastructure as code tool like Terraform is great at deploying uh, raw infrastructure or what I like to call infrastructure scaffolding. 
So setting up the raw in, uh, resources like the EC2 instances, the load balancers, your VPCs, the subnets, all that information, um, all, those, all those components are all created through uh, infrastructure's code. Helm, on the other hand, uh, is a tool specifically for deploying applications to Kubernetes. Um, so it has uh, some lifecycle management um, features. So you can do rolling updates against your charts. You can update these applications in real time. Um, you can manage all your deployments with Helm uh, versus uh, Terraform is more of a infrastructure focused tool. There is a blurry line um, between the two. So I would say, uh, you know, use Helm for Kubernetes application life cycles because, you know, you don't want to tie in together the life cycle of your Kubernetes applications with your infrastructure um, life cycle. So um, having those tightly coupled might, I could see, create some problems in terms of updating uh, and releasing your applications. Because if it's all tied to the infrastructure, then um, they're, they're kind of very uh, coupled there. Nice. And another question just came up from uh, Anthony, another Anthony, what would be your recommendation on deploying the mutual TRS within the cluster to secure the pods? What do you com commonly see in a, within the mesh? Yeah, so um, I've used uh, tools like um, Console Connect. Um, so that's a so that's a good question, and it's a it's a broad one. But I'm trying to distrust from my from my experience. So um, if you're if, if you're focused on um, understanding and operationalizing service meshes, that type of technology like Console Connect or Istio or even things like Envoy, um, those provide uh, MTLS out of the box. And uh, so for, for a specific project that I, I, I worked on that I can speak to um, was deploying Kubernetes uh, running console connect. And then additionally in that same environment, deploying vault enterprise. Um, so vault was a secrets engine that was being used to consume or to, to distribute secrets um, and some other uh, uh, encryption based uh, initiatives. But basically we wanted to use uh, a tool like Console Connect in order to control traffic between not only the applications running in Kubernetes, but when we have a heterogeneous workload where we have VMs and Kubernetes applications, um, we'd use Console Connect to control traffic between those two. So there's a few options out there that exist. Um, Istio is also one that um, provides you the ability to uh, control uh, or set controls over what services can connect to others. Oh. Yeah, so another question just came up. Uh, what are the changes required in uh, Terraform apart from the changing provider when you spin cluster in EKS, EKS, or a GW, or anywhere else? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so that's a common, um, a common, a common thing I, I run into when talking about Terraform. And the answer is that um, there's no transparent portability in Terraform, which means each cloud platform has similar services, but they are, they're called, the, the, the naming conventions are different, the nomenclature is different. So what you provision in AWS versus what you provision in uh, Google uh, would look different. So uh, what you can do in order to understand what you would need to do for that is I would just say, do a search on Terraform, uh, Terraform, let's say GKE cluster. Um, so you can just do a quick Google search and you can find what it takes to actually go ahead and provision that. So obviously these providers uh, use your native authentication mechanism that you're using. But in this case, uh, compared to what I had, oops, um, let me move this over really quick. Um, this cluster, versus this cluster, uh, so AWS EKS cluster. So there's the name, the location, um, the node count. So they're, they're a little bit different looking, but um, that could just be an easy or quick Google search and uh, obviously takes some understanding of uh, Google Cloud. So you have to kind of know the basics about uh, each cloud platform when you tend to use it. But <clears throat> generally the way that you use Terraform is the same. So resource definition inside of this uh, code block or the stanza, it has some attributes that you pass in some values to. Um, and this is a basic example to get you going, example usage. So uh, 
if, if you wanted to understand what the specific differences were, I'd recommend that you go to the Terraform website and do a search about the specific resource that you'd like to create. Cool. Uh, thanks for the answering. Uh, the other question, the, can you talk about ownership of the tool you mentioned based on your experience? Which team is supposed to take ownership for HAM, Kubernetes, and Terraform? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so typically, uh, there's, there's a separation of concerns uh, for developers and operation or infrastructure teams, networking teams, and so on. So in my experience, there's an operations team or infrastructure team that is uh, managing the Terraform code bases, and they work very closely with their customers, which are the development teams. So um, typically developers that are using, or if, there's, if Kubernetes is a component of a workflow within an organization or business unit, um, the developers have an understanding of Kubernetes. They may not be managing the cluster themselves, but they're building the Kubernetes manifest, they're building CRDs, they're building the container images. So if you shift the, the, the Helm um, and Kubernetes stuff is more shifted left on the developer side, but also really depending on how the teams are structured and the infrastructure management, the infrastructure requests that are coming in, um, people that are burning down the backlog for all the Terraform related uh, initiatives is typically the operations team or the infrastructure team. Yeah. That's from, from my experience. Yeah, maybe we can call them the DevOps team. But yeah, but the, yeah, <laughs> DevOps. Exactly, yeah, it's like everybody's kind of responsible for more, people are more aware of what each other are working on, so. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Uh, I think it's no more questions. So, all right, uh, that is all question that we have time for today. And thanks again, uh, the Anthony, for a great presentation and a really lovely demo. And thanks for joining us today. And the webinar recording and slides will be online later today, I already mentioned it earlier. And we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. And have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Anthony.